I will buy candles this Christmas. Candles of joy, despite all the sadness. Candles of hope, where despair keeps watch. Candles of peace, for tempest-tossed days. Candles of grace, to ease heavy burdens. Candles of love, to inspire all my living. Candles that will burn all year long. Next, we have Andrea, who will be singing All Holy Night. So I just want to, um, I think it's preference a little bit. Um, so I grew up Methodist, and one of the things um, I really do miss about being Methodist is singing um, Christmas songs. I love to sing Christmas songs. Um, and when we're at home with my family, um, I sing my holy night at their Christmas Eve program every year. So I appreciate you all um, listening to a very traditional Christmas song, um, even though we're not as traditional here. Um, I'm also going to not use the mic, and I'm just going to stand up on the stage and take my mask off. I hope that's okay, because it's not as pretty as I have a mask on. So I'm just going to step back. Um, I will also say maybe and I didn't get our um, other music worked on, so you're only going to hear from me tonight and not maybe, but um, I'm sure she's singing in her heart, right, Nate? <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. laughs> The stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and ever calling till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for your love breaks a new and glorious morn. on your knees, oh,
Next, next we're going to have an original reading by Carter Smith called Memories from a Frozen Tundra. I mean, we could just sit back down and have Amy Greer go over it. Maybe we don't really care. So, ivory memories from a frozen tundra. Christmas typically proved, proves to be an interesting time of the year for many. I have to be honest, all I remember is the joy of Christmas when I was young. Granted, I was really young. Gives you an idea of how young I am. However, all of that changed in 1992. It was Christmas Day. The gifts had been opened, the leftovers had been consumed, and all of us went to bed. The next day, the day after Christmas, I woke up and the house was quiet. And my mom came in after I'd fallen back asleep and woke me back up. She had some news to share. I was three at the time. So this is early in my life. She had to tell me that my grandfather had passed away in the night and he wouldn't be coming back. He had died after going to bed that Christmas day. Now being young, this memory is seared into my mind. And at the time, as a young person, the only thing that I could comprehend and was upset about was why didn't he say goodbye? Because I didn't fully grasp what was going on. From the funeral, all I remember is sitting there and back, trying to behave, my grandma feeding me tic tacs so I would shut up. And then afterwards, when she went to try and hold me, she accidentally spilled coffee. But besides that, but no, maybe, yep. Yes. Better? A little better? Sound issues, wonderful. Uh, so what do you want me to do? Just talk, okay. <laughs> Do you want me to be bothered with this? Heavy emotions. That would mark the end of happy holidays at the Smith household. My grandma took it hard. It was a massive heart attack that had killed my grandma father and much of the blame was placed on my aunt because my grandfather and her had gotten in a fight that day when she decided to leave early because she didn't see spending any more time on the farm as being important over the following years things were hard and slowly fewer decorations were put up fewer time with family was spent people stopped visiting and eventually got to the point as a teenager where my mom would joke that my grandmother would not simply be allowed to sit and sulk in her house by herself with her cat. And she would force me to go over and tell my grandma she had to come over for Christmas dinner. Now, ultimately, it sounds rather sad and depressing for a Christmas experience. And in the end, much of my childhood, I remember, was spent resenting Christmas coming and waiting for it to pass so that we could enjoy the rest of the year. 
However, there is work to be done with Christmas. And part of that is reclaiming the holiday and reclaiming life in general. Because memories like the snow from a distance on the prairie all appear white and pristine, crisp and bright. And on a sunny day, if you stare long enough, your eyes will begin to hurt because of how bright it is. It's like life. When we look at it from above, as Carl Sagan said, a pale blue dot, life is overwhelming. There's so much to take in, so much to do, so little time. My grandma's process of coping with trauma was probably not the best. Better? Okay, good. Now I don't have to. My grandma's processing with trauma was probably not the best experience for a young child. And quite frankly, it was annoying at times and very melodramatic. But as an adult, I've used that life experience to my benefit when I've decided how to behave around others in good and not so good ways, and sometimes to my advantage. At a recent family funeral, her cousin, or I should say nephew, admitted that the Bjorlands had a history of holding a grudge. And if they decided that they didn't like you, they made it very clear, and then they refused to change their mind. My grandma was just like that. As an adult, through my own healing work, instead of using that for anger, you can decide to use it for good. You decide that something's going to happen, something's worth believing in, a cause that's worth fighting for. And you sit down, and you decide that it's going to happen, and you don't give up. And you're stubborn like a good German. So, from a distance on the prairie, all appears white and pristine, crisp and bright. And on a sunny day, you can see forever. Maybe in the end, life is a lot like snow. From a distance, everything is bright and pristinely clean, clean. And at times, when taking in the whole thing, it is overwhelming and just too much to grasp. Our memories are like snowflakes. No two are the same. And upon further inspection under the microscope, we realize just how unique and truly amazing those memories are. What was white snow from a distance when we get closer, we find is mixed with dirt and grime, leaves of a season past, and a reminder, foot tracks and indentations, grass and plants patiently holding out for the return of the long summer days and the warm sun, summer sun. Our memories, like the snow, have many feelings. Some of us will like some of them, some will just surprise them. Others, we will want to lay in bed and pretend never happened, just like snowstorms. Some of us take joy, some of us ache in our joints, and some of us begrudgingly go out and shovel the sidewalk. But like the snow, that is life. Not every chapter will be one that we enjoy. During Christmas, the best gift that we can receive and give is when we take the time and put in the work to be at peace with our memories. Investing in our own well-being is not, ju not just a gift, because in doing so, we're able to celebrate them as a whole, share them with others, and use them as a gift to help change the world around us and hopefully inspire others to let go of what is no longer needed and accept the gift that today is. Because in the end, the fact that we are here and able to hold this space and time together with each other is simply that. Thank you, Terry, for solving the mystery of electronics and so forth. I would like to have Apollo come up and we'll have uh, Terry pay. We come in. <laughs> <laughs> I did write that once. <laughs> It'll be uh, your rendition of Jingle Bells and Jingle
has agreed to be substitute for John Calvi and his traditional reading of Twas the Night Before Christmas. Follow the kid show. <laughs> well, you're pediatrician. <laughs> okay. This is uh, Clement Moore's a visit from St. Nicholas. It was the night before <laughs> Christmas when all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. Stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds, while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. And Mama and her kerchief and I and my cap had just settled our brains for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from my bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. The boom of the breast of the dune fallen snow gave a luster to midday the objects below. From what to my wondering eyes did appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer. The little old driver, so lively and quick, I knew in a moment he must be Saint Nick. More rapid than eagles, those horses they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer, now Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Downer and Blitzen. To the top of the porch, to the top of the wall, now dash away, dash away, dash away all. As leaves that before the wild hurricane fly, when they meet with it, with an obstacle mount to the sky. So up the housetop, of course, as they flew, with the slate full of toys and St. Nicholas too. And then in a twinkling, I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoop. As I drew in my head and was turning around down the chimney, St. Nicholas came with a bomb. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys hung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry. His cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard on his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of his pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke had encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, right jolly old elf, and I laughed when I saw him, in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to work and filled all the stockings, then turned with a jerk and laying his finger on the side of his nose, and giving a nod up the chimney, he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle, and away they all flew, like the down of the thistle. But I heard him exclaim, and there he rode out of sight, Happy Christmas to all, and to all good night. Thank you. Uh, we didn't have a, a book. Well, I actually did have a book, but it was a pop-up kind of book. Kind of, <laughs> kind of awkward. Anyway, um, I'll have Ella come up, and she's going to sing, I'll Be Home. We're going to try to have the music here with it too. We'll see. Okay. Okay. Since you come to make sure I'm a bear, sleep into love is spreading everywhere. And came and took off with the spring. So 
Charles Dickens by Garrison Peele. Uh, this writing is from the Writer's Almanac by Garrison Keeler. Now, all you adults know who Garrison Keeler is. Um, he, was, he wrote it on December 19th of this year. It was on this day in 1843 that Charles Dickens published A Christmas Carol. A year earlier, he had read a disturbing news story about child labor in England. And so he visited Cornwall to see for himself the horrible conditions of child workers in the mines there. Then he visited free schools for poor children. By the time he was through, he was so angry that he declared to write a book exposing the terrible situation of children in poverty and published it at his own expense. That was known as a Christmas Carol in prose, now just called a Christmas Carol. 
A Christmas carol follows the change of Ebenezer Scrooge, a mean old miser. At the beginning of the book, his view toward Christmas is, and I quote, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. <laughs> and after hearing that some poor people would rather die than go to prisons or workhouses, all he can say is that they would rather die, they had better do it and decrease the population surplus. But by the end of the story, he has taken on the role of a second father for the crippled son of a man who works for him. And then he exclaims, I'm as light as a feather. I'm as happy as an angel and as merry as a schoolboy. A Merry Christmas to everybody. In 1840s England, Christmas was enjoying a comeback. It had once been a huge ceremonial event, but in the 17th century, the Puritans, a religious group, declared it illegal. For nearly 150 years, celebrating Christmas was a criminal offense. Since the actual date of Christ's birth is not named in the <coughs> the Puritans were suspicious of Christmas, thinking it was too pagan. A toned down version started to be celebrated again in the 18th century. But it was only in the years before Dickens published A Christmas Carol that the holiday was really taking off, partly because Queen Victoria married a German prince, Albert, and having a German influence in the royal family helped repopularize traditions like Christmas trees. A Christmas Carol showed the holiday as a time uh, for simple pleasures, for gathering around the table, what we call the Christmas spirit. It was also a time for parties, for dancing and playing games, which was dangerously close to pagan rituals in the eyes of some folk. But Dickens' vision of Christmas caught the imagination of readers in England and America and it helped create the Christmas ideal that is all around us today. Thank you. Next, we'll have an original uh, composition uh, by Ralph Dittman. Uh, called A Year Alone. Uh, hi. Um, I was gonna sing this, I was gonna sing this originally, but I tidy got the best of me, so this is what you're getting. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, that was great. Um, now we have a performance once again in Bob Phillips, Ragnarok Rudolph. Well, Thank you. 
Have Jan come up and read now the work of Christmas begins. <laughs> when the song of the angels is still, when the star in the sky is gone. When kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flock, the work of Christmas begins. To feed, to find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among others, to take music in the heart. This is from Howard Thurman. He was a prominent African-American author, theologian, educator, and civil rights leader, and uh, had the opportunity to teach both Martin Luther King Sr. and Jr. And now we'll have Twas the Night Before Yuletide. This was written by CC. Was the night before Yuletide, and all through the glen, not a creature was stirring, not a fox, not a hen. A mantle of snow shone brightly that night, as it lay on the ground, reflecting moonlight. The fairies were nestled all snug in their trees. Unmindful of flurries and chilly north breeze, the elves and the gnomes were down in their burrows, sleeping like babies in their soft earthen furrows. When lo, the earth moved with a thunderous quake causing chairs to fall over and dishes to break. The little folks scrambled to get on their feet, then raced to the river where they usually meet. 
What happened, they wondered, they questioned, they probed. As they shivered in night clothes, some bare armed, some robed. What caused the earth's shudder? What caused her to shiver? They all spoke at once as they stood by the river. Then what to their wondering eyes should appear but a shining gold light in the shape of a sphere? It blinked and it twinkled, it winked like an eye, then it flew straight up and was lost in the sky. Before they could murmur, before they could bustle, there emerged from the crowd with a swish and a rustle, a stately old crone with her hand on a cane, resplendent in green with a flowy white mane. White mane. As she passed by them, the old crone's perfume, smelling of meadows and flowers of bloom, made each of the faithful think of the spring, when the earth wakes from slumber and the birds start to sing. My name is Gaia, the old crone proclaimed, in a voice that at once was both wild and tamed. I've come to remind you, for you seem to forget, that Yule is the time of rebirth, and yet I see no, <clears throat> I see no hearth fires, hear no music, no bells. The air is filled with rich fragrant smells of baking and roasting and simmering stews, of cider that's mulled or other hot brews. There aren't any children at play in the snow or houses lit up by candles glow. Have you forgotten, my children, the fun of celebrating the rebirth of the sun? She looked at the fate folk, her eyes going round, as they shuffled their feet and stared at the ground. Then she smiled the smile that brings light to the day. Come, my children, she said, let's play. They gathered the mistletoe, gathered the holly, threw off the drab and drew on the jolly. They lit, on, they lit a big bonfire and they danced and they sung. They brought out the bells and clapped when they rang. They strung lights on the trees and bows oh so merry in colors of cranberry, bayberry, cherry. They built giant snowmen and adorned them with hats and surrounded them with snowbirds and snow cats and bats. Then just before dawn, at the end of their fest, before they went homeward, homeward to seek out their rest, the faithful they gathered around their favorite oak tree and welcomed the sun beneath the tree's finery. They were just reaching home when it suddenly came. The gold light returned like an arrow shot flame. It lit on the treetop where they could see from afar the golden like sphere turned into a star. The old crone just smiled at the beautiful sight. Happy Yuletide, my children, she whispered. Good night. Before I do the closing words, I want to thank all of you for donating your gifts and talent and nerves for this evening. Closing words for hard times. This is by Marie Killeran. No matter how weak or how frightened we may feel, we each have gifts that make a difference in the world. In the coming week, may you do at least one thing to support the broken, to welcome the stranger, to celebrate what is worthy, to do the work of justice and love. Be strong, be connected. Each day act so you may be a little more whole. At the conclusion, we're going to do a silent night and uh, we'll start by lighting candles and we'll pass them on to the next person. And instead of singing, we'll hum silent night. Then uh, proceed out and uh, we have a celebration in the Saturday room. Thank you.
Thank you. 